Nine were killed at the airport. Travelholics Boy, I heard you on a fuck shit, nigga. Fuck you. Pulled up with the Mac 10. Let it dumb school. Dropped out. I'm in the trap house, nigga. Fuck school. Thrax down. Pull the blade out. Then it's done through backwards. Bring the grams out. Do you know what I'm about to do? I'm about to buy a selfie stick. I never thought it would come to this. Amazon. Because, why not? Oh, selfie stick tripod. Ooh. This might be good, actually. How much? Seven pound ninety nine. Fuck it, I'm bowling like an athlete. But got no jumper. I'm not that bowling, really. That I should be doing stuff like this. But I'm saying, fuck it. Maybe I'm saying, fuck it. Maybe twelve pound ninety eight with shipping. Didn't even look before I first buy. Stupid mode. Why did I just buy a selfie stick? Because it'd be really useful for recording these vlogs. My hand gets very tired holding the phone out here, right? And I know I mostly point the camera at random shit for that exact reason, and also for other reasons. But uh, yeah, having a selfie stick will be very useful for these vlogs. I won't have to tire myself out. I'll have the camera at a good angle because it's. It'll be like, you know, far enough away that it actually makes sense. And uh, I'll be able to vlog walking around my room. And mm -hmm. apparently it's got a tripod on it. So I'll be able to put my phone down and record wherever I need to. So I uh, don't know why I've never done this before, really. So today, you might be interested in what you're watching, by the way, that's that's uh, that's how I meant to start this. You might be interested in what the fuck you're watching. So today, I, um, well, some, some, some things happened. Um, not crazy things, just things in general. Um, so, uh, a while ago, a few weeks ago, Someone I used to go to uni with messaged me and said, "Hey, um, I, I, she, she, she changed uni. She moved you to a different uni, to a better uni. Um, but we, she was, I went to school with her. She was the only person I knew from school who went to the same uni as me. So we, she was basically the only person I talked to at that uni, right? Um, she messaged me. If you, we haven't talked since she changed." Uh, unis, but she messaged me the other day and she said, hey, um, for my final project I'm supposed to collaborate with three different people. One of my people dropped out at the last minute. Uh, would you be willing to help me out and make some music with me? And I said, not really thinking about the consequences of what I was about to do, yeah, sure, I'll be a nice person and help out this uh, person who needs help with something, plus, you know, get to make music, it's not really a hassle for me, sure. I'll just be a be a, a good friend and help this person out. This was a mistake. Not anything against her. She's a perfectly nice person. It's all just me. Because I didn't consider the consequences of my actions. Um I would that I would have to, you know, go out go over to her house and make music and stuff. So we arranged a date. I moved, I, origin, the original date that I was supposed to go over, I just was not feeling up to it at all, and I cancelled the day before, so we moved it to today. But she was, again, very nice about, she's a perfectly nice person, I have absolutely nothing against her. Um, 
So today I uh, I set my alarm for one p.m. and I was I was like I gotta get to sleep, but uh, nothing was helping me sleep. So oh yeah, because yesterday I I ended up taking some uh, beta blockers for my heart because I was getting anxious and palpitations. When I took it, I thought it won't be a problem. But then I looked it up, and apparently, you're not supposed to mix beta blockers with antihistamines, which is what I would have used to help me sleep, chloramphenamine. Uh, but apparently, you're not supposed to mix those two things. It can cause all sorts of complications, and actually raise your blood pressure. So I decided, better. It's it's probably relatively safe. It's not like super dangerous, but not worth the risk, in my opinion. So I decided not to take it, which meant that it took me a bit longer than normal to get to sleep. I didn't sleep until a bit later, plus the drillers were waking me up. I would wake up to drillers, then manage to fall back to sleep, then wake up to drillers again, then go back to sleep. Drillers next door, by the way, in case you haven't been keeping up with the law, they're doing building work next door, and they'd start drilling and making noise at like 9am. Um... I didn't go to sleep until like 5 or 6, so obviously that woke me up, but I kept waking me up a little bit, and I managed to get back to sleep and wake me up. Eventually, my alarm goes off, I'm like, uh, fuck. Um, I stay in bed for another at least half hour, struggling to get out of bed. Managed to get out of bed, have my breakfast, do whatever. I'm a little late, so I'm in a rush. Go there. Just before I leave, I'm like, fuck, I'm going to be on the tube for like an hour. Because she lives on the other side of London, so it's going to be an hour journey to get there. Already a fucking pain. Um, This is already a struggle. I really don't like being on the tube. I love the tube as a concept. I really like trains, and I like the history behind it. I like the design. Like the, The London Underground is a masterclass in civil design, like... You won't get lost in tube stations. They're so well signposted. Everything is so... Cl- it's like... I, I I really appreciate them from a, from a technical standpoint. The tube, tube system, the trains themselves. Like, I love it. But I can't fucking start... I get so anxious when I'm on the tube. Because you're like... You're underground in a, and it's really hot. It's not properly ventilated. Because it was mostly built in like the Victorian era. There's like... It's crowded. It's stuffy. And you're in a loud train. It's just, it's overstimulating. It makes me really anxious. It's been like this forever. Well, not forever, but it started getting worse but it, when I was a teenager. And it's never gotten better. I, and especially now that I haven't really been on the tube in, you know, a year or whatever. I mean, I, I have actually, like, now and then to, to do various things. Maybe maybe three, three times or something. But very rarely on the tube, so... I'm out of practice, and I'm, you know, I'm like, I want to need someone to keep me entertained, obviously, I'm not just going to stare at a wall for, um, an hour, so, I'll put this mosaic.wav album on my phone, I actually don't have any music on my phone, so I was like, fuck, what, what album can I put on my phone, I've been listening to mosaic.wav recently, I'll put some of that on, um, so I, I get out, I, first things first, I put on Rainbow Bridge 3 by Cemetery, while I'm on the bus going to the tube station, uh, that album's growing on me. I still don't like it anywhere near as much as Rainbow Bridge 1, but I think it's a decent album. Um, and then when I go underground, obviously there's no connection, so I switch to Mosaic or Wav. And it was pretty fun, but I got pretty anxious. About halfway through the tube journey, I start getting really anxious and, like, you know, typical stuff. My heart starts beating fast, I'm finding it hard to breathe. Not a full-on panic attack, but just, like, anxious restless and stuff I finally get out of the tube at the other end plus it's not helping by the fact that I'm late and I'm kind of stressed about that as well so I'm and I've never been to this part like I've never been to this person's house before so I'm like oh fuck I'm nervous about being up with her we haven't talked in ages I go over to her house she doesn't care at all I'm late she's very cool about it she doesn't give a fuck she's like yeah cool there's no problem I'm not in a rush it's fine we sit down we make some music all goes pretty well her flatmate is also pretty nice. Seems like a, a cool person. Um, Shouts out to the autistic they-them flatmate. 
<laughs> Wish I had an autistic day then, flatmate. That's like the most based you can possibly be, right? Um, yeah, they seem pretty cool. Um, and also this girl even offered to cook me food as a thank you, which was very nice of her. She made a, well, we made together like a nice sort of tofu stuff where I guess it was good. It was, you know, all in all, it wasn't a bad time. It was a bit stimulating, like it was a bit overstimulating. There was a lot of social activity and it was very intense. Like I, I basically spent five hours there just making music and it was mostly me because I worked like, this is good evidence to point to the fact that I am actually good at making music uh, that I always forget is that I work so fast compared to everyone else just because I'm so used to logic so I was just like banging stuff out and she was like I have no idea what the fuck you're doing right now and I was like don't worry about it we made the song together we didn't finish the song but we made like the hook together um, she has a bunch of neat gear like she has a, a Korg micro freak I think that's what it is it's a really cool um, synth, and we made some cool sounds on that, and uh, it was just fun in general. I mean, it wasn't like super, super crazy fun, but it, uh, and I was, I was very, stre like anxious the whole time because I was for some reason I, I was very worried about messing up so like social conventions the whole time. Um, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm in a a girl's house that I haven't talked to for a while, I haven't talked to anyone else outside of my core friend group for, like, a really long time, and I'm already, like, autistic, so I was very scared of, like, messing up social conventions the whole time, pretty anxious, pretty on edge, but I did have, and I was also worried that I was, like, being overbearing, taking too much control of the music, so I kept asking her, like, just tell me if I'm, if you, if I'm taking too much control, making the music, you can do, step in, um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, um, mostly I was more afraid because she's very much like a normie, um, for example, she at one point said that something I did was a, I think she said a classic Sagittarius energy or something like that, Sagittarius energy, that's what she said, this is, yeah, this sort of person, not the, but yeah, you know, nothing, nothing against her, but if you want to be into Zodiacs, fine, I don't care, but that's just the sort of normie, is what I'm trying to say, um, and, uh, yeah, it was pretty intense making music for that long, um, trying to navigate social situations, and then I'm, like, fucking tired, and I have to go home, so I'm, like, oh, i got to go home for another fucking hour on the tube, and I'm walking out of her house to the train station, and I'm, like, fuck, I have nothing to listen to on the way home, uh... I can't listen to that Mosaic Grave album again because I've listened... Yesterday I listened to it twice and today I listened to it once. If I listen to that Mosaic Grave album again, I will have a psychotic episode. <laughs> like, I will just go nuts. Not that it's a bad album, it's just very psychotic episode-y music. Uh, and, and I was like, fuck, i got to think of something to listen to. Um, 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 and the first thing that came into my head, don't ask me why, was Digi's Decompression Chamber. And I just went on YouTube, quickly looked up Digi Decompression Chamber, downloaded the fir first one on a YouTube MP3 thing, downloaded it onto my phone. I don't know why it was the first thing that came into my head, but that was the first thing that came into my head. And I just listened to that on the way back, and here's why I feel kind of guilty. It was probably the most fun I've had in my life. <laughs> it was, it was like, I don't know. It's like, it's like it's been long enough that the trauma of what's happened has sort of left me and I can enjoy Digi stuff again. Um, and it's also been like, I think, two years or maybe more since I've listened to the Decompression Chambers. I think more almost, maybe even, than two years since I've listened to all the Decompression Chambers. Definitely more than two years. No, maybe about two years since I listened to the Decompression Chambers. So it was like, I basically forgotten everything that, that happens in them. And it was like a fresh experience and it was very enjoyable. And I didn't have any sort of panic or anxiety at all because I was just listening to the Decompression Chamber. And I was like, I should do a decompression chamber. And I was, you know, it was, it was it was great. It was actually great fun. But when Digi starts the podcast, obviously, they mentioned drinking beer. And I was like, oh, I really want some beer, but I'm on a diet. And beer has lots of calories in it. And I spent the whole journey like, oh, I'm stressed. I need a drink when I get home anyway. Fuck it. I'm just going to buy some fucking beer. So I bought some beer when I got home.
And um, then I thought, do you know what? I need to record my own decompression chamber. So, well, actually, about halfway through the train journey, I was thinking, I, I have a lot of stuff to decompress about after this stressful day. Um, a very stimulating day. Um, I should make my own decompression chamber. And then as the journey went on, I was thinking maybe instead of a decompression chamber, I just make a, a video um, because it's, you know, a bit more involved. And so that is the story of how we got here, why I bought the beer, why we're making the video and what happened in my day today. That is the story that you all wanted to know about. And there's pretty much nothing else to mention. I'm watching Gochi Monwa Usagi Deska season 3 right now. Pretty good. Very Moe. I love Moe. This will be a running through theme through the video. Moe is the best thing ever. When I was buying my beer, I was waiting in line and I saw this on a shelf. Mike's Hard Seltzer never seen it before and I was like hard seltzer and then it says underneath alcoholic sparkling water and I was like haha that's neat but who drinks that and I looked underneath it and it says a hundred calories five percent alcohol vol volume two grams of sugar and I thought to myself I'm on a diet maybe I should remember this um, it's only a hundred calories for a whole thing that's much less than beer and 5% is about the same alcohol volume. I'll, I'll remember that. But I wonder how much it costs. So I looked at the price tag. One pound. That's ridiculously cheap for alcohol in the UK. Alcohol is very heavily taxed in the UK. Very cheap for alcohol in the UK. Cheaper than any beer. What? And I thought, fuck it. It's only one pound. I gotta try it, right? So this will be my review and first reaction to Mike's Hard Seltzer Black Cherry Flavor, the only one they had. It smells like black cherry, very fruity. Let me get some water so that I stay hydrated. All right. I don't know what I'm expecting from this, but, uh, bombs up. Very fizzy. Very fizzy. <sighs> That's not bad. That is not bad at all. I was expecting this to be disgusting. It's not the greatest thing ever. <laughs> okay, it's got a bit of an aftertaste. It's got a bit of an aftertaste that isn't very pleasant. I wouldn't drink more than one of these. I'll drink one and it will be relatively enjoyable. But I definitely wouldn't drink more than one of these. What does it taste like? I don't know. It tastes like it, nothing. It tastes like... It tastes a little bit strongbowy, which of course the dark cherry, strongbow, dark dark fruit, it's a little similar, but the the texture's different. This tastes way more watery, which I guess it's water, the alcoholic sparkling water, so that makes sense. Hmm. I'll tell you what, if you didn't tell me this had alcohol in it, I might not have even noticed. You really can't taste the alcohol very much at all. No artificial sweeteners made in the Netherlands. Interesting. Purified water, five times distilled spirit, natural flavors, sugar, lemon juice from concentrate, citric acid, and sodium citrate. 100 calories per 330 mils, which is what this is. 100 calories is not, honestly? And for, like, normally these sorts of diet drinks are targeted at like middle class white people so they're like expensive but this is only one pound 
there's not much. Like it's a t it's a three hundred thirty mil can, but like that's actually not a bad deal in my opinion. <clears throat> very sparkly though, very fizzy. It's it's almost got a bit monster, like green monster. No, like one of the monster flavors. I don't remember which one. Tastes a little bit like this. This is way less strong than that, obviously, and not as good. It's a bit bitter and quite acidy. This stuff. Hmm. Weird, weird fucking idea. Who comes up with alcoholic sparkling water? Guess Mike. <laughs> this is Mike's. Do I recommend this? I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who isn't doesn't care about calories. Like, like if you if you are someone who either doesn't care about the calories you consume or you do enough exercise, it doesn't matter. There's no reason for you to drink this. It's not as good as any other alcoholic beverage. But if you do care about calories, this might be worth it. Almost. I, again, I wouldn't drink more than one of these, though. Might be good as, like, a... Like a, like a, I don't know. Like a casual drink. Maybe, like, a lunchtime drink, even. You know when you have, like, a... <clears throat> when you just have a, a lunchtime drink? Is this is this an alcoholic thing? I've seen people have lunchtime drinks before. You have, like, a late lunch, and you're like, I'm gonna have a drink with my lunch. This would be perfect, because it's not very strong, it's quite small, it's not heavy at all. This would be perfect for like an early lunchtime drink. It's actually quite refreshing, I, I, might, I might say. I might even buy this again. Mm, the thing is, the more you drink, the more the flavour like gets a bit grating. Like you take, it's kind of like like, very like like instant ramen. There's this thing I call the instant ramen effect, which is when you take your first bite of instant ramen, you take a bite and you're like, oh my god, this is the nicest thing I've ever had in my life. Then you take two more bites, and then you realize, oh, it's the exact same flavor every single time. Oh god, what have I done? I don't know why. It's good for one bite, but. Once you finish the whole bowl, it's like, like it's not bad. I like instant ramen, but it's like, it's just you realize, oh, it's just the exact same bite, fifty times. That's what this is like. The first time you sip it, you're like, that's not so bad actually. That's not actually quite nice. And a second, a third, by by the time you're like, I don't know, I feel like by the time I'm like halfway through this bottle, I'm gonna be, or can I'm gonna be, pretty fed up with this flavor. I give it a 6 out of 10. I'll be real with you. One of the other reasons I'm making this video is that there's I have nothing else to do and I'm bored. My internet just went down for like a minute and I freaked the fuck out. But thankfully it's back now. In my last video, I talked about every slice of life anime and then I, I added Tally Tally to my plan to watch but I've done a bit more research on Tally Tally. I've watched the the PV and read some reviews of it and stuff. It seems like it's a melodrama show. So we're going to delete this from my plan to watch because it doesn't look like the sort of Moe slice of life stuff that I'm trying to watch. Uh, as for Two Car, I've wanted to watch Two Car for just forever because it's such a wacky concept for a show that it's just like I need to watch it even though it's probably not very good. In the same way that I needed to watch um, Bakuon, the one with the motorbikes, uh, the other one with the motorbikes, other than Tuka. It's crazy that there's two whole shows that are about cute girls do motorbikes. One of them is cute girls do motorbikes with a sidecar. Very strange, but fucking based. Uh, anyway, so we're not watching Tally Tally, we're gonna be watching Two Car, I guess. Um, the only reason I'm watching anime is because it's easier. 
than reading. Um, although No Game No Life is very easy to read, uh, mostly. But I don't know. I mean, I've I've finished the the third book, so the rest of the series is like stuff that's not in the anime. Um, maybe it'll be harder to read when I don't have an anime reference to compare it to. But um, it's pretty easy. It's very easy to read. Like it's not not written with difficult language or anything. It's like very basic shit. Canon, however, is a bit of a slog to read. Even though it's fine, like it's a good it's good, it's a bit of a slog. I need to shave. I was gonna shave today and I forgot. I'm trying to look for decent places to record, but I can't this is why I need that tripod selfie stick thing, because ain't shit to record places. Ain't places where there's shit to record. Gotta be certain floor gotta get floor pilled, you know. Um, one thing first, I forgot to mention in the first earlier part when I was talking about what I did today. When I went over to this girl's house, I played her fucking... <laughs> I was just like, fuck it, you know? I was completely dissociated the whole time, so I didn't know what was going on. And she was like, you want to pour some music on? And I was like, oh, sure. First thing I thought of was, um, you ever heard of Prince of Thunder <laughs> I played her some Ethan. I played a shout out them lesbians like the first few tracks, and then I was she was like she seemed to like kind of like it, but was very confused by it, and I was like, you want to hear my new album? <laughs> and so I played her like the first three, three or four songs on I Give It Trap Star Connect. She seemed to she found it quite funny, uh, but she didn't really seem to understand. She said I feel like I'd like this better if I understood the anime references, and I think that's makes that's a that's a pretty legitimate critique if you don't understand the anime references then you're you're losing a lot of the album then i played her some mosaic dope wave and then i played her some hella and bygones then i played her um yeah i put like biblical violence and the second track on Hold Your Horses. I played those. I played the Bygones album, which I, I I played for a while while we were cooking. And then I played Cemetery. I put on uh, Slaughterhouse. Um, and then I was like, I, I literally said to her, you ever heard of Ruben Slick? And I was about to put on uh, Ruben Slick. L hold on, wait. I need to ask Plunder for the N-word pass real quick. <coughs> Give me a second. If plan is not online, then we have a problem. Ayo, hey, can I get a M word pass real quick? Alright, we'll see what that happens. So, I was gonna say, you ever heard of Ruben Slick, right? <laughs> but, oh, plan responded. Here, look, you can see. Uh,. I'll have to blow out some of these. Oh, it doesn't matter. They're, they're pretty reasonable messages. But uh, it says... Focus, please. All right, well, whatever. I don't know if you can see this. Hey, yo, can I get an word pass real quick? Uh, for show, sure, here's one N word pass. That's what it says. That should be legitimate, right? That should be legal tender. It's the name of a song. I think I've done everything I possibly can to forgive myself for saying this, to allow myself to say it. Eh. So I was, I was like, hey, yo, you ever heard of Ruben Slick? And I was going to put on Like a Nigger. I fuck hoes like a nigger, yeah. I fuck hoes like a nigger, man. 
like, wait, this is a terrible mistake. This is a terrible mistake. I can't play that for her. So I just was like, quickly, oh fuck, I gotta, I gotta bounce off. I gotta play it off like it was nothing. And I put on, I don't know, I don't remember what I played. Some, some like, uh, something else. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, that would have gone very bad. I don't think I should have played that for her. She would not have understood the deep connotations of Ruben Slick. Um, I want to say thank you to Plunder. Um, anyway, let's go on to what I was actually wanted to talk about, which was Patreon. So how does Patreon? It's doing okay. Like it's, it makes me I think about fifty quid a week uh, a month, which is reasonable. But I think I could be making much more if I actually put effort into it. But the thing I wanted to talk about is really like I don't know how to do a Patreon. I think when it comes to Patreon, there's two approaches, both of, both of which seem to have merit, but are also antithetical to each other. And I'm kind of trying to do both at the same time and ending up in a middle ground that doesn't work. So when it comes to Patreon, you can either put your best stuff on Patreon, the logic being, this is the stuff that all my other content is free, but people are actually paying to see this content. So I should make sure the stuff I put the most effort into is on Patreon where people are actually paying for it because, you know, they expect a higher quality. They are actually paying money for it. They deserve a high, highest quality of work that I'm putting out. So all my highest quality stuff should be on Patreon. That's option number one. Or number two, I should put my highest quality stuff out for free and then have the Patreon reserved for sort of like the the deep law fan stuff that's relatively low effort. So like podcasts, um, exper- more experimental or like low effort demos and stuff like that. Um, these sorts of things. Because the people who are patroning me aren't patroning me because they want to get access to, you know, my videos or whatever, or my music. They're, they're patroning me because they already like my music. Right, and anything that comes with the, they're basically doing it as a donation, which is what it's supposed to be. And anything that comes with that is sort of like an extra bonus for them. But they're doing it out of their own goodness of their heart because they want to support me. And in order to get more people to support me, I should put my best stuff out, uh, not paywalled, and then have the Patreon stuff be like the stuff that only real hardcore fans will care about. Most people won't give a shit about because it's kind of you know not super high effort, not super polished. So these are two different attitudes that are completely you can't do both of them. Which one's the correct one? Which one do I actually do? What is this? Oh, is this? Okay. I never I didn't even notice that I was there. Which one do I actually do? Right now I'm doing like both badly. <laughs> both are neither at the same time. Either way, I really need to be paying more attention to my Patreon. I keep um, actually doing rewards. I keep forgetting. Or um, just not really understanding my own system because I didn't make it very clear to myself. I need to be doing rewards better. I need to be uploading more music, better music. I need to make them... This is another thing about my Patreon. Okay, just... This is a question to all my audience, by the way. Um, of, like, this is... this is. Please respond to this in the comments if you have opinions, because I want to know what you guys think. So, firstly, I know this isn't a fair question to ask it right here, but I have no idea whether my Patreon supporters know about this YouTube channel. Like, I, I know some of them do. Um, can I see them in the comments, but I don't know, like, are people patroning me because they like my vlogs, or do they not give a shit about my vlogs and they just like my music? Like, most people who know me don't even know that my vlogs exist, let alone do they give a shit about it, they just want to hear music, I think. But maybe people who patron are deep, deep lore fans who care about the vlogs, and they want to be, they want more vloggy personal content like podcasts and, and exclusive vlogs and this sort of thing like a sort of digi patreon type of situation or maybe it's mostly people who are interested in music and they want early access releases demos and exclusive music i don't like which one do i prioritize i have no idea because my music on patreon even though i post it regularly doesn't get much attention and this is the other thing that's t- tough about patreon is like Sure, the people who are on there like are paying for paying to have access to it, so it should be especially high quality. But the problem is that I don't have many patrons, and so if I decide to do something for Patreon specifically, only like 
a very, very, very small amount of people are ever going to see that because very, very few people will even patron me. And people, even people who do decide to patron me later, very few of them actually, and I can see the statistics, very few of them go through the older posts. Like they go through maybe a few of the older posts, but they don't go all the way down. They don't scroll to the older, older stuff. So only a few people are ever going to see it. So it's like, you know, I'm putting something out, but um, I would feel like I'm depriving people my wider fan base who maybe would patron if they could but can't afford it or something like that of whatever I would put on there if I put loads and loads of effort into it it would feel bad if it was like oh I'm putting loads of effort into this and only six people are going to see it like that's there's there's different like there's different levels of that where, where I'm like I don't, I don't know if I want to do that even though those six people might be people who are paying paying to get to see it like, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, so, yeah, basically, I want to know which attitude do I take towards Patreon? Do I put my best stuff out for free and then leave the Patreon as, like, ex basically bonus extras, low effort stuff? Or do I put the Patreon, like, pay that, or do I do, like, a, I don't know. I don't know. I just need to become a human content machine again. Or as I like to call myself back in the day, an inhuman content, an inhuman content nightmare. The inhuman content nightmare. I just need to be making more shit. Then I have plenty of stuff upon Patreon. Um, but yeah, maybe I... I definitely... Whatever happens, I need to be paying more attention to the Patreon. And I need to be shelling it more. Because um, I think it, it's a valuable resource. Not just because I want to be making money. Although, also because I, I need money. But... Um, also because it's a good platform, like it's actually a cool idea to have like a Patreon supporting thing, like it's just a generally cool platform. So like I need to be putting more effort into that. I need to be um, figuring out how I'm going to do that. Um, people say I've heard that you put your best stuff public facing and then you were like extra stuff Patreon, but I'm not sure. Anyway. And I also, yeah, again, I don't know whether I should be doing Patreon vlogs or what. Um, do I do Patreon vlogs? I suppose, like, as a sort of bonus extra, I can do Patreon vlogs. Um, like, is there anything else I should be doing for the Patreon? Maybe more podcasts, more songs? I have no idea. Like, tell me. Tell me below in the comments. Other than, if you aren't, if you if your reason is I can't afford it or I don't really care enough to give you money, that's, don't bother commenting that. But if you have thought, like, if, if you've considered patroning and then you've decided not to, or if you are a patron and, you know, or if you were a patron and you stopped, or if you are a current patron, basically, I want to know information about what to do better because I I'm, I'm realise I'm not taking good care of my patron and I'm really leaving it as, like, an afterthought, whereas it should be a priority. So tell me, please. I just thought to myself, fuck it. When you're hungry, you're hungry. I was trying to make this video relatively short. I was trying to make it like 45 minutes ish. But it looks like that's not happening since we're already almost there and I'm not even close to done with the stuff I wanted to talk about. So I need to keep things succinct. We're going to talk about Akiba Trap Star Connect, the album I just put out. Very briefly, we're going to talk about it. Mostly, if you've listened to it, you can probably tell. It was mostly inspired by Kanye, Lil B, Ethernet, TJX6, and that's about it. A little bit of, there's a little bit of early Young Lee and a little bit of Ralph Ingo in there. A little bit of, um, maybe even a little bit of Space Ghost Pop in there. Maybe even a little bit of, like, Raider Clan in general. A little bit, oh, Cemetery as well, definitely in there. 100% Cemetery in there. Chief Keef also in there. And Young Chop, obviously. When, you, when you're talking Chief Keep, you're talking Young Chop. Uh, 
Um, I'm pretty happy with how the album turned out. Uh, it's been nuts. It's been nuts. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy. For a yes, thank you album, as a yes, thank you album, is a neat, it's a neat little thing. It's a neat little thing. It's got moments of funniness. It's got moments of seriousness. <clears throat> pretty much what I got to say about it. Um, surprised that my audience has taken to it as well as they have. I thought people would be a bit mad about me posting it, but it seems like people um generally seem okay with it. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Man, beer make you burp. That's a fact about it. Um, second thing is Horizon in the middle of the band, though. Coming out very soon. Me and Plum, this project together. Coming out tomorrow. Indeed, tomorrow. Gonna be extremely dope. There's a four track EP, I think. Four or five tracks. Um, trying to... Trying to encourage this MP3 compression idea that I've been having. So, you know, like, you got a surge and, and like, hexed shit of, like, people who are bit-crushing music because they want to, like... There was lo-fi hip-hop where people were running music through plugins and made it sound like tape or VHSs. And um, that was fine for back then, but now we're in the 2000s era of nostalgia. And the best people can think of is to run their shit through a bit-crusher. But nothing was run through a bit-crusher in the 2000s. Like, I mean, maybe some things were, but it, like, that's not what I think of it, 2000s internet music. I think of MP3 compression, but people can't fig seem to figure out how to do it properly, but I know how to do it properly. You use a plugin called Lossy by Goodhertz, and um, it's a really good plugin for doing this, for making MP3 artifacting. Um, and so I, I ran most of Akiba Trapstar, all of Akiba Trapstar Connect through Lossy, but not too extreme, just a bit extreme to to make it seem more lo-fi. But um, this hit mob is very much focused on this Lossy compression MP3 stuff. Uh, and it's also a bit more surgy. Basically, it's like, it's a little bit uh, RCB type of shit, but, but me, and, me and Plunderfied, you know, me and Plunderfied. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. We actually made it ages ago, but we just never got around to releasing it because we kind of always intended to make more songs, but then we never got, we sort of never made more songs. I mean, there's a whole other album of hip hop stuff, but it's too experimental to be this. Um, that might come out at some point also. I don't know, maybe I'll leak it to someone. But uh, I hope you enjoy IDK Where I Am, I Forgot, I Guess. By Horizon in the Middle of the Bando, A.K. Hip Mob. Um, please buy it on Bandcamp. Shit like that, you know. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. In the last clip I was talking about, I talked briefly about lo-fi hip hop and VHS compression and tape compression and, or, or um, filters, VHS filters, tape filters, stuff like that. And it's a good bring me on to this topic. So uh, I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh nostalgia culture so in the west you know we just had to, relatively recently the sort of 80s boom before that it was sort of a 90s vaporwave boom and that sort of transitioned slowly into an 80s aesthetic so like first you had like early vaporwave well i guess early vaporwave is still over 80s but like c-punk that type of shit and like lo-fi hip-hop that's like 90s and then like at some point that got switched into like 80s Vaporwave, and then at some point that got switched into like synthwave, and like eventually you end up with Stranger Things. It was a very strange situation, but um, we had this big 80s boom, right? I'm sure you all remember it. And then, um, now we're in like a 2000s boom. Everyone listen, everyone loves Kesha. Um, I've talked about this before. We have this nostalgia cycle in in the West, we, we just love this nostalgia cycle. People don't seem to remember this, but in the late 90s, 
uh, in the very late 90s and very early 2000s, there was a 60s boom. People don't seem to realize that that happened. People seem to have forgotten that there was like a 60s nostalgia thing in the 90s. And people also seem to have forgotten that in the 80s, there was a big 50s nostalgia thing. Like, think about it. What are the staples of 80s aesthetics? Like chrome and neon. Well, chrome and neon, think about what that reminds you of. A 50s diner, right? Because that was a 50s throwback back then. So in the 80s, there was a 50s throwback. It was like, it's always been happening. And this is like, something to do with hauntology. I don't know. Something, Derrida probably something. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but there's nostalgia is like a big part of culture. People really into nostalgia, remembering their childhoods and stuff like that. And I think that's going to be universal because whatever you grew up with is going to influence you. But there's a difference, right? Because like we seem to want to like recreate the stuff that we grew up with, but in like a rose tinted way. But what's so interesting about otaku culture is that it completely negates nostalgia. I was so expecting to see, like, any anime do, like, an 80s throwback at any point. None of them did. 80s throwbacks were everywhere in culture, and no anime did it. The only thing I can think of where anything like this happened in anime is a show called Anime Gatari's, where which is a fucking insane show towards the end, because in the last three episodes, the characters realise they're in an anime, and when they realise that, the world starts crumbling around them, and while the world is crumbling around them, part of that, the, they, like, their character designs change into, like, uh, like, early 90s, late 80s character designs, and the screen goes into 4 by 3 uh, uh, aspect ratio, but that's like a brief little throwaway gag, basically. That's the only time I can think of where there's actually been a throw, like a, a throwback nostalgia thing in an anime. Uh, and that's not real. like, it's more of a gag than anything else. It just doesn't happen, which is kind of crazy to me. Pe- anime is all about iteration, incestuous iteration. It, uh, rather than, like, looking back on, like, Oh, well, we're going to... Well, since 2000s nostalgia is in right now, we're going to be make, remaking 2000s nostal- um, 2000s harem shows are going to come back into popularity. That's not happening, is it? Completely different things are happening in anime. You've got, like, Isekai, the rise of Isekai, and, like, uh, all of this shit, where it's, like, this weird... You know, in the early 2000s, Moe and Cool separated... Like, late 90s, early 2000s, there was this Moe and Cool separation. And then, like, which was slowly happening from, like, about... About Ava to, like... It started with, like, Ava, just like everything. And it sort of reached to around, like... Two, 2003 was, like, when the separation was non-negotiable. And then they've just been slowly coming back together, where now all of the... Now shows are, like, both Moe and Shonen at the same time. And, like... Pure Moe shows are actually going down, and pure shonen shows are going, like, less and less. And you've got this, like, fusion of where everything's like an isekai harem show, which is both. Uh, But none of that's got anything to do with nostalgia. Even if you look at, like, shows which have clear influences, people are influenced by what they grew up with in, in otaku culture, of course, like... Uh, Arno grew up with Gundam and made Ava, which is inspired by Gundam. People who grew up with Ava made things inspired by Ava, etc. But there's not this nostalgia cycle thing. Instead, people just basically do the same show over and over again. Like, if you think about Lucky Star, K-On, uh, Hidamari Sketch, Azuma Gadayo, Yu- Yuyushiki, Yuri Yuri, uh, Gotcha Yusa, etc., these are all the same show, (laughs) like, they're all basically the exact same TV show, like, in the West, we have one show like that, it's called Seinfeld, we have one, it's like, oh, it's a show about nothing, where nothing happens, we have one, it's called Seinfeld, Uh, there's, like, other sitcoms, but things happen in those sitcoms, right, like, we have one, they did it once, 
other people tried to do it, but they did it differently, where things happen. In Japan, they just did the same show over and over again. They, they, and this is the thing. That's not a bad thing at all. All of those shows are great. I love all of them. As you know, I love Kayon, I love Lucky Star, I love Hidamari Sketches, I love Yuri Yuri, I love Yushiki. Like, all of those shows are some of my favourite shows of all time. And they're basically the same premise, but it's the subtle differences between them, the little character differences. Like, oh, Lucky Star is more, like, otaku culture-based and, like, uh, a bit more surreal and kind of dreamlike. Azumanga Daio is, like, a very, very, um, sort of pure and gag-based. Um, Hidamari's sketch is very much focused on the main character's friendships. Uh, y Yuri Yuri is a bit more, like, wacky, com comedy-focused, uh, with, like, Yuri aspects. Yuyushiki is kind of, like, halfway between Lucky Star and Yuri Yuri. Like, they all have their little differences, but they're all basically the same show. We don't have that. Like, we, we don't have shit like that. Like, it, 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 that's what I'm trying to say. We need to be doing that. We need to just be iterating and iterating and iterating on the stuff that we're into. Like, people who made Yuyushiki, as long as they grew up on Lucky Star, Lucky Star was only a few years before that. I, I don't remember exactly when all those things came out, but, like, it wasn't that long ago. And Azumanga Daio wasn't that long ago from that, which was a, a, the first popular, the first slice of life cute girl show that anyone cared about. And, you know, that wasn't that long before. So it's like, it just happened like that. Like, suddenly... Come on. I'm not clicking very well. I don't know why I can't click very well, but, like... Do you know what I mean? It's not. There's no nostalgia it's bullshit. There's no nostalgia bullshit. There's no like, oh, we got to recreate the stuff that inspired us. It's more like that inspired us, but instead of fucking with that, we're gonna do this, the the thing I talked about in my dissertation, which is taking the current trends and just extrapolating from them. Not looking back to nostalgia. Not like you know, Western side. This is the thing. Western cyberpunk music. It's all like take 80s music, put it more 80s, and then you synthwave, and then it's cyberpunk, or, you know, stuff like that. But, like, the music in Serial Experiments Lane is, take the music that is currently the most cutting edge, which at the time was, like, industrial techno, and just extrapolate, where's it, like, just take the current trends and just make them continue into the future. And that's how you get the music of Serial Experiments Lane. That's how you make good sh shit. That's how you make good art, is doing that. You just incestuously... Take take the current trends and just extrapolate and iterate. Then that's how you end up with Hidamari sketch. Bear is great. I really love our goal. Controversial opinion. Alcohol is unfairly maligned. People who are into drugs, they will... Oh, I don't... don't no, alcohol is a terrible drug. I only do... 2-methoxy-16. I don't know what... I just made that up. But, like, uh, I feel like that's an attitude I see. It's stupid. Alcohol is a great drug. In my generation, people just smoke so much weed. Everyone and everyone my age just smokes weed constantly. <clears throat> I can't do that. It makes me too paranoid. And I thought I was like weird for, for that. I used to smoke weed constantly. I don't know why. But I was bored, I guess. Didn't have anything better to do. I suppose it's enjoyable. It's been a long time since I smoked weed, so. But like, like even today, when I went over to that girl's house, she offered some weed and I said no, because I didn't want to get paranoid. Um, but like, I feel like people smoke too much, you know, you should, shouldn't, smoking every day is not a good idea. Like it, it definitely fucks with you. Maybe, maybe, like, on a weekend is a good idea. Like, maybe a few times a week. But every day, I don't think it's a good idea. Especially the amount these people... Like, weed these days is so strong. So much THC in it. 
it's, it can't can't be a good idea. Uh, but yeah, I think I actually, even though weed is very far because of drug, I think I way prefer alcohol. Because like when I smoke, I get worse at everything. I can't like I get worse at making music. I get worse at everything. I can't remember anything. I could, I get worse at socializing. I get worse at everything when I when I smoke. When I drink, I get better at everything. I get better at making music. I get better at writing. I get better at making videos. I get better at socializing and talking. That's a fun joke, right? It's like weird. It's fun. It's a good like it's 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 been too long since I, I need to smoke some more weed and give you a proper review. But it's, it's been a while. But I thought it was like really weird for having this decision, this this uh, opinion. But there's a comedian called Doug Stanhope, and he has the same opinion. Like he he is like a proper druggie. Like he does coke and as and all the all the the shit that drug people do. But he also drinks a lot, but he doesn't smoke weed. Like he smokes weed very rarely because makes him parent it's not his drug and I was like oh that's right you can have preference you're allowed to have preferences you're not you don't have to just like everything so maybe that's my preference I mean I guess I like it but it's like I don't know it's a weird situation it's a weird drug like I think it's way more powerful than people give it credit for and like yeah I don't know I, I don't think I'd want to do it that often it's a strange situation, for sure. Uh, I haven't really done any drugs for ages. Except alcohol. Um, haven't really at all. Used to be the drugs guy. Now I'm not so much. They, they all sort of start to blend into one after a while. Although I understand, like... Being a... Uh, being interested in like the pharmacology of it that's a different situation but like moe unironically moe is is a like the best drug ever invented like it's i love cute girls i love moe so much i love moe it's like what's the Drugs that impair your ability to experience the things that you want to experience. Like, right now, I can't read No Game No Life or Canon because I'll just forget everything I read today. Like, I'm not that drunk. I'm, you know, reasonably drunk, but I'm not, like, blackout drunk. But I can't, like, I won't be able to focus on the words, first of all. And secondly, I'll just forget it all. I know, because my memory isn't good anyway. We throw alcohol into the mix. I, I just won't remember anything. So there's no point in even trying. I won't be able to focus. Like, that's a bit of a shame. But I can watch anime. Uh, that's no problem, and I can watch YouTube or whatever. Well, that's not, a, not an issue. Oh, shit. That's not an issue, so it's not too bad. I used to get stoned and watch anime. I, um... We watched Oz Manga Dio stoned many years ago. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. It's a perfect... Perfect... Thing to watch when you're stoned. It's just like the best thing ever made when you're stoned. But, uh, I don't know. I was a different person back then who was more into that. Not really so interested in that anymore. Uh, information and moe are my drugs. And alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol's good. It's a good drug. Guess you, fuck, guess you fucked up. But, like, like, the onus is still on you. 
like that's the thing about more euphoric drugs is that they take away the onus they 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 they, they take control they're just like whatever you're doing will make it enjoyable because you're stoned or you're nodding or whatever like when you take a high dose of opiates and you're just nodding you're not even doing anything you're, you're like just sort of passing in and out of consciousness so it's like you're not doing anything it's kind of boring I mean it's not boring because you're euphoric but like it's boring whereas with alcohol you still have to take responsibility and be like I need something fun to actually do while I'm drunk otherwise there's no point and I think that's like an advantage that's like a good thing I don't know if I'm making any fucking sense right now I love Moe. I wonder if I can... Is this good? Does this look good? Maybe. I love Moe. I love Moe shows. The problem is, there's simultaneously too many and too few of them. There's a... As we saw recently, there was over like a, one and a half thousand slice of life shows on now or whatever. There's a bunch of Moe shows, and like that's not even counting like harem shows, those are like kind of Moe shows, plus like visual novels and light novels and stuff like that, Moe gay, stuff like that. Like, there's there's too much Moe. The problem is that most of it is actually shit, most of it is really fucking awful. Um, most of these shows are just awful, and most a lot of these light novels are also pretty fucking awful. Uh, I mean visual novels, sorry. Also pretty fucking awful. Particularly, like, a lot of visual novels seem to nail, like, they have a really good common route and then the character would suck. Uh, but they're, like... I love Moe. I need Moe in my life. And I can't just rewatch the the same seven shows over and over again. I need to be finding new Moe characters and stuff, right? And the only way to do that is to find hidden gems. You need to find hidden gems out here. You need to find them because that's where they're hiding. That's where they hide the Moe. They hide it in the, the hidden gems. That's why they're called hidden gems. They hide it down there in the hopes that you'll never notice it. But someone's going to notice it, and that someone is me. Um, but it fucking sucks looking for them. Because you can't... The thing about hidden gems is you can't trust anyone. You can't, like... When it comes to a show like k you, you can find a bunch of people who will tell you to watch k -On. When it comes to a show like Mahoraba, you can't find anyone who will tell you to watch Mahoraba. I'm the one that will tell you to watch Mahoraba. Right? And the only reason is because I spent... Ev I tried to watch every anime from 2005. That t that season... The series is coming back, by the way. I promise. I will continue 2005. I will finish every anime from 2005. It's gonna happen. Um... But yeah, the only reason I found Mao Aba, which turned out to be one of my favorite shows, is because I was watching every anime from 2005, and most of those were fucking awful, like, a bunch of them, that's why I stopped the show, because so many of the 2005 anime were just terrible, and, like, not even in an interesting way where I had stuff to say in my videos, like, most of them were just terrible, and boring, and shit, and not even worth talking about, uh... That's the case when you're hunting for hidden gems. You have to just go through a bunch of bullshit where they all fucking suck just for the hopes that you'll find a Kokoro Toshikan, just for the hopes that you'll find a Mahoraba, you know? And those are, like, basically the only two shows I've discovered myself uh, that are, like, genuinely great. You know, every other good show that I found, like, I keep thinking, like, I've yeah, I've just watched all the good slice of life shows, right? Because I've seen all the ones that people talk about that I know would be decent. I've just watched all the good cute girls doing cute things shows. I've just watched all the good slice of life shows. I've watched all the good Maori shows. But it isn't true because I found Kokoro Toshikan and I found Mahoraba and no one talks about those and those are two of my favorite shows. So it's like, they're down there somewhere. But you have to dig through so much shit to get to them. Like, you can't find something like that unless you're willing to go through the trouble of watching a bunch of fucking awful anime just for the off chance that it might be decent. 
Um, and then for the off chance, there'll be a hidden gem. Like, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to find this shit. I'm I'm out here. Like, I'm a mine mining mining away for these hidden gems. They're hiding from us. They don't want to be known. They need people who are dedicated to it. And I don't know if I'm that person anymore. I don't know if I can be bothered to fucking trawl through it. Like, I, I have to. I don't have a choice. I'm, I need Moe in my life. But, like, it's this fucking slog to trawl through all of the bullshit, terrible shows that are completely uninteresting just to find a gem that might not exist. Like, what if Mahodaba and Koko Toshikan are the only two shows I ever find myself that are, like, decent, and all the other shows I spent, like, it's quite possible. It's quite possible. There's just, there's just fuck all you can do with a human being out here. When you're looking for Moe, which is why I, I, I stopped looking in anime and I started looking in visual novels, because I know there's Moe in there. The problem is, with Moe... Like, it's a bit, like, it's a very intensive process. Uh, like, when you look at the... Drop my phone. Um, when you look at, like, the the pure Moe shit, right? Like, like the pure slice of life stuff, like Hidamari Sketch or... I don't know. Uh, you know, all of these sorts of things. It's just a bit, like, you can't marathon these shows. You just can't. If you do, you're losing something from it. Like, you... You don't want to mouth on it. Uh, they're, 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 like, you cannot... No one in the world can tell me they've marathoned Arya. And if you have, like, you haven't experienced it. You need to watch Arya slowly. You, you, like, if you mouth on it, you're losing something about it. You, you can't do that. It's that sort of situation. Like, the, there's such thing as an overload, because it's a very intensive type of situation. The thing with these visual novels is they're always so long that you have to do that. You have to just, you end up, you have to basically mouth on it. Like, especially if you're me, I can't stick to things, you know. I, I have to do things quickly or I'll just stop uh, and, I'll you know, I'll just give up. Because if something takes more than a few, you know, days, I'll just, it's like, I'll just get bored of it and move on. It's very hard for me to stick to things. So I have to be quick. But, like, being quick kind of ruins the experience. Uh, so it's kind of fucked, is what I'm trying to say. I did have a bunch of other stuff I was going to talk about. But, um... It's later than I expected it to be. I was trying to pace myself with these videos. Like, uh, clips, sorry, that I was recording for this video. I should have paced myself, so I was like, okay, I'm not just going to record them all in one chunk. I'll spend the whole night recording little segments. But, uh... I, I mispaced myself. I went too slowly. And now I'm tired. And I don't really want to record anymore. And so that's it. I, I, I decided against some of the other segments I was going to do. Some of the less interesting ones. And, um... I suppose that's the end of this video. I hope it's vaguely watchable. 